Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for having me here. Uh, before I get started, one of the things we learn in communications in general is to know your audience. So I want to just ask a couple of questions so I have a general sense of who's in the audience. Just two questions in particular. How many of you have ho heard of uh, or understand what corporate social responsibility is? Just show of hands. Okay, so maybe a quarter. And of that, qu well, of that quarter, how many of you believe that corporate social responsibility is one of the four or five most important things about the brands that you choose to work for? We okay, about the same amount. Okay. So that's helpful. Thank you. I thought that I would take more of a philosophical approach to today's presentation in the next 20 minutes or so, share with you some of the great brand experiences that I've had in my life so that I could, in turn, help you to the degree you would like in navigating your career journeys. I've been fortunate to work for mostly multinational corporations and nonprofit organizations, and it's been truly a fulfilling career journey for me at 54 years of age. One of the things that I typically tell people when I do career coaching, which I do a lot of it, is that I have four questions. So I'll, I'll quickly list four questions for you to think about. The fourth one is the most important one, and I would ask you to think about not just today, but hereafter as you're thinking about what you're doing with your lives. Um, the first one is a very basic one, which is geographically, as you move along in your career, where do you want to be based? Is it New York? Is it China? Is it somewhere? Is it nowhere? It's just an important question to think about geographically. The second question I ask people to think about is functionally. Where do you think you'll be at your best? Are you good at sales? Do you want to be out and about with people? Are you more sort of introverted and you're comfortable being in front of a computer, editing, writing, and doing things on, uh, online? Um, so it's helpful to think about functionally not only what you excel at, but where you're at your best and at your happiest. The third question I ask people, and this is, I'll talk more about this in a minute, is to, to start to think about the brands that inspire you. And I don't just mean the corporate commercial brands, but also perhaps the, um, the schools, the nonprofit organizations, the charities you care about. But if you think about brands that inspire you, the brands that you are regularly talking about to other people knowingly and not knowingly, that is a good way to start to hone in on what's really a good direction for you. It's also a way of uh, sort of what I would describe as um, when driving sort of your blind spots. I don't know if you know that expression or not, but there are parts of the car you can't see even with your rear view mirrors. And those blind spots are out there for us in our career journeys as well. So looking at brands is one way to start to find where your blind spots are, which could also become your opportunities. Uh, the fourth and the most important question that I would ask people when doing career coaching and I'm going to ask you to think about today, I don't expect anyone to answer it today, and if you did, I wouldn't necessarily believe what you said, um, is to ask yourself, what is your purpose? Why do you think you are unique and on this planet? What is it that you're going to do with your life, your time, your energy, your money, your networks to have a fulfilling career? So it's not a light question. It's a philosophical question. It's one that I believe comes with practice and discussion with your family and friends first, writing it down. But the more you can define your purpose, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, the further along you're going to be toward career fulfillment and happiness. Better to start to think about this now than when you're at my age at 54 and you've spent your career at a brand that really hasn't rewarded you, might be exiting you, doesn't necessarily share your values or share a sense of purpose. So think about not only your personal purpose is my main message to you today, but think about the brands that you are associating yourself with, where you're going to work, where you want to work, the brand that you want to build if you're an entrepreneur, and think about the values and the purpose of that brand. And if you are dovetailing or reconciling or combining your personal purpose with that of the brand, then you're going to be sailing on to a brilliant career. So that takes me to my purpose slide. Making a difference through daily exploration and discoveries. That's my purpose. It took me a lot of years to be able to write that down and say it that distinctly. But just being here today reinforces my purpose. I'm on a discovery, on a journey today with you. I don't know most of you. 
I'm thrilled to be here because I'm going to learn more about you and what you're doing and our speakers who've been here. So this is a self-fulfilling prophecy for me. And I love this quote that's attributed to Winston Churchill. It's also been attributed to other people. I happen to believe that it's incredibly true, which is that we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So I would encourage you to think if that feels right to you and if it's something you want to embrace, it's been incredibly helpful to me in my career. Going to uh, some guideposts in my career, as you can see with the, the brands, these are brands that I've been involved with throughout my career, and there are many more, but it's fun to visualize and look back and think about this. They're all, in my view, really important, very significant. Um, I was telling the doctor earlier, I rescued several dogs from this little refuge. I'm on the board of this refuge, so his pet, his pet store, uh, concept is exciting to me. I've worked with the Democratic Party, uh, the Humane Society, again, the Animal Peace, the New York Times, Razor Fish, Christie's, and so on. All these brands I chose and they chose me, and I think it wasn't just coincidental. I think it was a deliberate action on both parts because of shared values and a shared sense of purpose or mission. So think about your brands and where you want to associate. My latest chapter started about a year and a half ago. I, I built, I spent 10 years at Christie's Auction House, a 250-year-old art auction house, English, and um, for seven years I ran the communications function, and in the last three years I built the corporate social responsibility platform, which we called Art and Soul. Art and Soul because that got to the root of what the business was about, art, and in Seoul, because what we were trying to do by engaging our employees and our clients in something higher than just transactions, a higher purpose, that brought a little bit more meaning to those relationships with our clients and in the collaborations that we created. Collaborations such as the Green Auction, which raised millions of dollars for environmental action, working with multiple um, nonprofit organizations such as Oceana and uh, Conservation International, and working with great collectors and families such as the Rockefellers, and then even fun, fun rappers like Nicki Minaj and the celebrated editor Anna Wintour at Vogue. So when you start to practice what this is that I'm talking about, this purpose-driven career journey, I think you'll find that you're gonna be more inspiring and more fun to be with, you're gonna have more fun, and therefore people are going to want to work with you and be part of that higher purpose. That's been my experience anyway. Um, show of hands, how many of you are right now in school? So about half, and how many of you are now full-time employees elsewhere? Okay, so this is an exciting time for you. I would encourage you to really take stock of this Particularly, it seems many, most of you, I, it's, I think, are foreign-born, correct? Is anyone born in the U.S.? Okay. So, wow, you have such a huge advantage right now because you not only understand education and community in your home countries, but you're now exposed to education and community in the States. So, combined, those two things are going to give you a huge advantage as you venture out from your, your, um, your studies into your career journeys. Um, what I did at about a year and a half ago is I took all of my experience with these multinationals and then I built my own brand called Philanthropic Impact, or PI. And PI, I like the PI analogy, sort of helping philanthropists and individuals and brands round the circle to become more efficient, more effective in their philanthropy or their corporate social responsibility. So. It's been really fun, really consistent with where I've been in my journey. But what also happened was then this last summer, I took an additional job. Uh, I've joined the United Nations Global Compact. How many of you have heard of the United Nations Global Compact? Show of hands, any of you? Just a couple. All right, so the UN Global Compact is the agency in the United Nations, which is the intersection or the conduit between the UN system and between the private sector, between the business community. So we're essentially a CEO membership organization. We have some great Chinese firms um, that you would know like Fosun. Um, I think you know Jack Ma and Alibaba. He's been a great advocate for the work that the UN does. A lot of Chinese firms. Um, and what we do at UN Global Compact is get these businesses, help these businesses, these CEOs, integrate into their business models solutions 
for the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Again, show of hands, how many of you have heard of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs? Okay, this is exciting. I would really encourage you to, to research the SDGs. Once you see them, you'll start to see them everywhere. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals were agreed to two years ago by all member states of the United Nations. So over 160 nations said yes, these 17 issue areas, these 17 buckets, poverty, education, climate, these are where all the world needs to focus its time, energy, and including the business community, we need your efforts. So our 13,000 members at the United Nations Global Compact are integrating into their business solutions, not just things that will make money or generate loss, but those things that will also have a positive impact on the 17 SDGs. There is, I don't have it up here, but there is a round wheel, 17 colored rainbows. Again, you can just even now Google it on your phones, you'll see the SDGs are here to stay. So as you're thinking about your career journeys, thinking about your purpose, thinking about philanthropy or corporate social responsibility, know that the SDGs are out there. It's a turnkey way to impress people with your CV and with your, your efforts if you link them to the seven, your efforts to the 17 SDGs. And I am uh, very, ha I'll be at the lunch day and I'm very happy to talk more offline um, about any of this. Um, so a couple of tips that I I've, I've, would leave with you um, before we take some questions. One is that the networking digitally is great. How many of you are on LinkedIn? And, okay, not actually just about a third of you. That's interesting. I would have thought more. And how many of you are on WeChat? Okay. So those, those digital networks are hugely important, but I also can't underscore enough how important it is to get out in situations like you're doing today, right? To network in person, face to face, put a name and a face together, ask questions, squirm through difficult conversations, this is what's gonna make you even more successful in your careers. The more you can interface physically in an analog or a old fashioned way, the better off you'll be. Um, I also encourage you to write regularly, not just about your purpose statement, but about, but about your goals. The more you can distill into a simple statement of what you plan to do, how you're going to get there, the better off you will be. For those of you who are now gainfully employed, um, I'd like to hear more during the Q&A and during lunch about how, if you agree with that, because I think that the art of writing is critical to success. I see too many candidates now for jobs who cannot write well. So take advantage of all the training and education you're getting right now and practice, 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 because writing is, is incredibly valuable to a successful career. Um, convening and connecting, this is something I do with my business of philanthropic impact, and try and do it in non-conventional ways. I'm here today as part of my journey, as my, my adventure is to meet a whole new group of students from another part of the world that I haven't met with and to learn from you this is non-conventional for someone like me, a 54-year-old professional man working in Manhattan. So I thank you again for having me here. I personally exercise every day, and I try and meditate at least a few moments each morning. How many of you meditate? Okay, if you Google and you see, ask how many CEOs meditate, you'll be surprised how many really successful leaders that you recognize that you want to have them as a mentor meditate. How many of you exercise each day? Okay, I would encourage you to exercise, it, it, even if it's just 15 minutes of walking, but it can't just be about your phones and your work because you won't have work-life balance, and I promise you when you get to my age, you're not gonna be happy if you haven't gotten a health, healthy body, healthy mind, as well as a healthy career. So for what it's worth, I highly recommend this. And then um, collaboration is critical. Um, that's why I'm happy to be working with all of you today. I'm happy to work at the United Nations Global Compact because we collaborate with 13,000 CEOs from around the world. It's about sharing the lift and that creates more creativity, it creates more fun, and it makes it more efficient and effective. Um, and last but not least, I would say just put a stake in the ground. If you're not sure either after this presentation or at the end of today or even at the end of this year or when you graduate, if you're not sure about what next looks like, just put a stake in the ground. I would not overthink it too much because of who you are, the training you have, the experience you have being here now, you're gonna do more than just fine. But don't waste too much time trying to think if it, you should go this way or that way because there's no wrong answer. What I've learned in my career 
is that it's a rear view, in the rearview mirror, it all makes sense. You won't have any regrets about what you've done as long as you just take proactive, positive steps and you try and reconcile with, with this concept of your purpose and what you're meant to do. This is a little metaphor. This is how I used to look at my career. It was a Rubik's Cube. I think you all know Rubik's Cube. I worked in multinational settings, so we always had sort of the, the, um, the matrix where you would have your functions and your geographies. I added a third dimension, which is the movement of those functions, geographies across time. And that served me very well for my career with all these companies, the New York Times, American Express, Christie's. But where I've gone more recently with the launch of Pi is over here to the atom, only in as much as, as I've moved through time and through uh, different brands, different career journey steps, I've been the, the sort of the center of it. And all these other brands around me, now including you, are part of it. So, you don't have to embrace the Rubik's Cube or the Atom, but I think from a communications perspective, you're well served to think about what's the best way for you to think about how you're organizing your professional career. What's the best way to think about how you're presenting yourself to others and make it as efficient and, and communicable as possible because it will help you get there more swiftly, more efficiently, more effectively. And when I'm not in the room or your friends and family aren't in the room, someone will have a better understanding of who you are, what your purpose is, and what your contribution can be to their organization or their brand. So you will be much further along in going at and getting what you want because it's on mission for you, it's on mission for the organization, and you've made it clear and communicated well. Um, this final slide, I think, well, maybe it's not there. I wanted to show you one last slide. I think this is an old slide. Um, what you would see in the slide, if I had it here, is this young two students who are seniors at my alma mater, Hampton Sydney College. And their names are Tanner Beck and Jackie Chang. Jackie Chang is Chinese uh, immigrant to the United States. Tanner's from Florida. I had a similar a group address like this last year in Virginia at my alma mater, and I spoke to them about purpose-driven careers as I'm speaking to you now. And they started a, uh, a an enterprise called PAN, P-A-N um, Clothing. And PAN Clothing is really fun casual wear. You can see the logo in back here. It's really one of my favorite sweatshirts right now, but the proceeds from these clothes go to buying secondhand books to go to students in Haiti, which is where they had gone on a, a, a trip, were exposed to students who didn't have books or they only had one book per classroom. And Tanner and Jackie said, you know what, we can do something about this. So they started a Kickstarter campaign. They raised $14,000. They started producing shirts that are really great, really affordable. And the picture they sent me on Monday from Haiti was where they were delivering their first set of books. So the picture, I'm sorry it's not here. I'll get it through the organizers of this to you later if you want to see. Um, was just a text from Jackie of the two of them with these students using the book saying, wow, I really now I'm starting to understand this purpose-driven um, career concept. And I wrote back and I said, you got it, good for you. And they wrote back and they said, it gives, me even, it gives us even greater drive or more inspiration to do it now. So for what it's worth, whether it's pan or it's pie or whatever it is that you're meant to do on this planet, I really encourage you to make sure it reconciles with a purpose, a higher calling than just making money. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions or comments. I really welcome your feedback as well. Over it's you. your Q&A time, so um, actually I have a question for you first. Um, you've mentioned it's important to have a, a purpose-driven career path. How did you find your purpose? Was there a specific event, a specific life-changing turning point, or a cumulative, a series of experience that kind of um, made you have the realization, wow, this is what I want to do, and this is my goal, what I want to spend the rest of my life doing? It's a great question. I th if I could, I'll answer it for me, and I will say that beforehand that I think it really always gets back to the individual. Um, some of you, some people will have a life-altering experience, and that makes them want to do something specific, whether it's surviving cancer or serving in the military or what have you. Uh, for me, it's been, I'm a lifelong learner. I'm a liberal arts educated person. I am a generalist by nature. So I'm always curious about the other, about you all being out and about living and traveling and working around the world, studying around the world. So that adventurer in me is who I've always been. Mm -hmm. 
And that adventure in me is also, and that liberal arts training, which many of you are getting at your, your schools now, grounded in values, that's always had me be reflective and asking questions and examining. So through a reductive process, I concluded about two and a half, actually when I turned 50, 50 is a good time when you say, what have I done with my life? What, am I, what do I stand for? Am I, crisis, kind of? Well, it wasn't a crisis. It was actually exciting for me because I knew what I was doing. I'd always done what I was That's meant awesome. to do. Yeah. So the purpose was just declared then, but it was already evident in my being and in my practices. So. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions from the audience? Uh, the gentleman and then the lady, please. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to ask you questions, so you might as well ask. <laughs> CSR and uh, philanthropy, like uh, technology, startup company, and uh, small business. Uh, if I understand the question, how do you combine tech with CSR? Uh, like uh, the startup company and the small business, how yeah. they can do CSR and uh, philanthropy. Yeah, well, I would say uh, Jackie and Tanner, they haven't even graduated from college yet, and they've already started their business. They're off and running. So I think it gets back to the individual who's starting the company and what he or she values and where they think they can make a unique uh, contribution to society as well as running a business. Tech is really interesting. You're, you're all following, I'm sure, the scandals now between Uber and Facebook and the influences of the election and all of that. Um, it's been my experience, particularly from my years at Razorfish, that tech is young. And the mindset of young companies and young people is inspiring and adventuresome, but life happens. So that's that sort of movement of a business or an individual across time. So make sure in starting a CSR practice at a company or starting a company that you're baking in that values piece, that you're getting that purpose piece in. Because I, I'm seeing this now a lot in China. I spent about two weeks of a quarter in China. And the Chinese entrepreneurs who are making it, I think that they're still, it's a gross generalization, but I think they are coming back, having made the money, having gone public, but not being fulfilled. And I think it's because the values piece, and it's not unique to China, by the way. I see it in Silicon Valley with the Googles and the, where they think they don't have an issue with women and, and inclusion. Or um, where Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook thinks, well, we'll just change our mission to reconcile the fact of what just happened in the election. You saw this summer that Google, or that, um, that Facebook said that their mission is going to change now. So it's no longer about connecting the world because they did that and it sort of didn't do well with the US election. But we're going to bring the world closer. So that was a subtle but important distinction. I think it's a sign that the tech world is growing up and realizing, wow, we need the values piece, we need to bake into our, our practices more responsibility. Does that help answer your question? Okay, yes, the young lady. Oh, one and then the other. How are we on time? Um, we have seven more. Seven minutes. Okay, good. A very quick question. Uh, I'm a student from NYU, and I want to question because I want to open my own startup, and I'm an international student who had no resource. So I want to ask you, uh, how can I improve my uh, interpersonal skills or the resource to talk with more people in the U.S.? Thank great. You. I, I have a. I have two great recommendations. One I already shared with you. One is, as I've said already, write. Like if, you, if you can put into one page in a really compelling way, almost like the who, what, when, where, why, and keep it simple and keep refining it, refining it, and refining it, maybe add in visuals, that story that you will tell through that one piece of paper can work for you so well, even when you're not in the room. It's different than a CV, right? Talking about your purpose is not your resume. Your purpose is something you cherish. You talk first to yourself, you write it down, then you talk to someone you trust and love who knows you well, like your mom, your dad, your sister, and they will tell you, you are so full of bull, that is so not you. Or they'll say, actually, that is so you, you need to do that. Once you get to that point, any brand, any person you talk to is going to know that they need to get out of your way because you are going to nail it or they need you on their team. So one is to write it down. The second one, particularly if you're not a, not a native English speaker, but one that I recommend to native English speakers all the time, it's cheap, it's easy, it's on your schedule, is Toastmasters. Has anyone ever heard of or done Toastmasters? One, two, three, four. 
five, six. Okay. Toastmasters is an international organization. It's a public speaking course. And you do 10 speeches over however many times a year, a month, whatever it takes you to do. And the speeches get longer and longer with each um, of the 10. People overcome incredible challenges. In the chapter that I went through, I mean, women who had lost their children, cancer survivors, people who grew up with a lisp, all kinds of challenges. And they went through public speaking to get over it by talking about it. it and also people are just mortified of speaking in public like this. Most people are. There's some statistics that say people are more afraid of speaking in public than dying. <laughs> so, so confront that practice. And if you have, for example, this business you want to launch, that's the kind of speeches you'll practice in Toastmasters, and you get better and better, and it's objective critiquing of the participants, the members. There's only like 20, 25 members at any chapter. They're all over the world, and I think the membership is something like $100 a year. So, but it's all in English. Even if you sign up in Shanghai for Toastmasters or in Guilin, it's in English. So it's a really good practice. Yes. Uh, do you mind pass the microphone? Thank you. Hi, Toby. Um, I want to ask you how should young graduates who are just going to society soon and those with global insight and diverse background, how sh should they better sell themselves and seize the opportunities to be competitive? Well, um, Jackie and Tanner are one example, right, with the shirt. They started it. They started their business. It was purpose-driven. It is purpose-driven, and they've used Kickstarter to get it funded, and they're already differentiating themselves from other graduates from the school because they're off and doing something while also getting their, their degree. Um, I think that particularly because most you're all in the tri-state area, right? It's New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, all of you, right? So you have these huge opportunities to volunteer time now, right? You could volunteer at all kinds of organizations that will give you inroads to great brands and great people who support those organizations. So just to give you a hypothetical, and I'm happy to brainstorm this with anyone after today, but um, if you think about the boards that the CEOs and executives of all the big corporations in the tri-state area support, you might find that one of those boards or one of those organizations is, a one that, is one that really resonates with you as well. So if you're interested in the Red Cross or in the Humane Society or in um, or, uh, AIDS advocacy, Google, do a little desktop research. Find out not only who's volunteering at those organizations and who's on their board, but go one step further and see where those board members are coming from that might be places that you would want to work. Um, as an example, Pfizer is a fantastic company with corporate social responsibility, big pharmaceutical company. They're very involved in all kinds of nonprofit work in the, in the, around the world, actually. So if Pfizer is a brand that interests you, find out where the Pfizer employees are volunteering. And um, maybe you want to volunteer there. It's an indirect way to network, but it's it's still honorable, it's noble, it's purposeful because your networking is not just advancing you, it's advancing that charity or that nonprofit and presumably the brand, Pfizer or other that you might work with. So is that helpful? And ha oh, one last thought if I can't say anything else. Whatever you do, have fun. Like you're not gonna be changing jobs every day or every week. If you do, that's a problem. But you're gonna change jobs probably maybe more frequently than I did because it's the nature of the world today. I changed on average about every five years in retrospect. Um, you want to make sure that it's a journey, an adventure, not something that you're afraid of. So I tell people it's like a roller coaster, right? You can either clasp the bar in fear, oh my God, I'm graduating this spring and I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm so afraid. Or you can throw your hands up in the air and squeal with delight and say, oh my God, there's a whole internet way of researching out here and finding ways to network and I've got all kinds of people I can tap into. But one thing I can tell you for certain, no crystal ball needed for this, you're only going to get one ride in life. So if you are the person who throws your hands in the air and goes on this career journey inspired with a sense of purpose and joy and curiosity versus the one who's afraid, oh, my mom and dad tell me about the debt or I've got to get a job and I'm going to take the one I don't want because I just need to get a job. Long term, you're not going to be as well off. And 
long and short term, I can tell you that the employers that are going to want to meet with you, that are going to want to hire you, they're the ones that are going to see that person enjoying that ride, that adventure of a job search, a career move, purpose-driven person, versus the one who trembles in fear or faux self-confidence, saying, I'm qualified, I've got the accounting degree or whatever. But you, you want the full person showing up at your company or at your enterprise. You don't want a fear-based person. You want the purpose-driven person who's going to contribute to your organization and achieving its mission. So that's my final thought. for. Thank you, you so much. Thank you.